Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Derek Mosley. I'm the director of the Lubar Center for Public Policy Research and Civic Education. I want to be the first to thank you all for coming here today. We have an amazing program set up for you today, an important topic, um, federal perspective on Wisconsin-led pipe problem. Um, but before we get started, I wanted just to give you a little idea about some upcoming events that we have here coming uh, into the Lubar Center. Uh, first and foremost, I want to let you know that we have uh, an event that's taking place. It's a new event here at the Lubar Center. We call the Get to Knows. You might be familiar with the On the Issues programs where my predecessor, Mike Boucher, had people come up. Uh, and We had different topics affecting different issues affecting the city of Milwaukee. The Get to Know programs are a morning program. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit more laid back. It's about people who live in the city of Milwaukee or also in the state of Wisconsin who have an effect on our everyday life that we may or may not be familiar with. Our first one coming up is April 25th. Um, you can go onto our website to take a look and register for that program. It features Dale Kuyinga. Dale Kuyinga is the Senior Vice President of the MMAC. He will soon be taking over for Tim Sheehy and become the new president of the MMAC. Uh, he will be here to talk about um, his vision and role for the MMAC and their place here in the city of Milwaukee. On April 26th, we have an event, uh, an education event, uh, with Michael Hansen uh, from the Brookings Institute. He's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. He's going to be talking about the teacher shortage that we have not only here in Wisconsin, but also in the country. He will be here, and then afterwards, there will be a panel discussion with local Wisconsin education leaders to talk about how we can attract, retain, and support local teachers here, not only in Wisconsin, but also across the country. And then finally, we have an event that's taking place in May. It's also new. Uh, I brought along when I came here as director of the center. They're called our Heritage Dinners. Uh, we had one in February. That one was for African American Heritage Month or Black History Month where we had four African-American chefs who prepared uh, dishes that were introduced to the American palate by way of African-Americans. It was a way where you can get together, meet new people, try new foods, and also get a history of that food. We have one coming up in May for Asian Heritage Month, the same concept. We will have four chefs introducing different dishes of er uh, Asian heritage. Uh, so you can try these dishes, learn their brief history on how we became a part of our American palate and also get to meet new people. So uh, please take a look at our website uh, on the Marquette Law School website, the Lubar Center, and register for those events. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to the director of the Water Institute, Mr. Dave Strifling. Thank you. Thank you, Derek, and welcome everyone to this event titled A Federal Perspective on Wisconsin's Lead Pipe Problem. Uh, this is not the first time that we have convened a discussion about this issue. Uh, in 2016, we hosted a major full-day conference called Public Policy in American Drinking Water uh, that drove awareness of the lead and water issue among Milwaukee leaders and citizens, and we believe that event resulted in some real policy changes in the city. Uh, today, we welcome a distinguished guest, Congresswoman Gwen, Gwen Moore, back to Marquette to continue this conversation, and I'll formally introduce her in a few minutes. But first, we have two other short presentations for you. Um, here in Milwaukee, we've had our share of water problems, but one city's name has become synonymous with the issue of the lead in water issue, and that is Flint, Michigan. Uh, so earlier this semester, I learned that one of our Marquette Law students, Tyrese Denson, uh, is a native of Flint. And so to provide some background and context on why this discussion is so important to our families and our communities, I asked Tyrese to be here today to share a few minutes of his personal story about how the water crisis in Flint affected him, his family, and his community. So Tyrese, please come up. Thank you everyone for having me. Um, as Professor Stripling said, my name is Tyrese Denson. I'm a second year law student here at Marquette. Uh, I'm originally from Flint, Michigan. I was raised on the south side of Flint. Um, I went to college in my hometown at the University of Michigan of Flint. And I'm saddened that the issue that really, uh, I think, made Flint a national name, uh, lead in the drinking water and lead, uh, old lead pipes, uh, seems to be a really national issue in a lot of our communities. But I'm encouraged that uh, we're here to have this conversation and that uh, we're all meeting here today. So by the time that the water crisis really kicked off in Flint, I was living outside of the city at that point, but I was still working in the city. 
I was still going to school inside the city, and I still had a lot of family that was living in the city. Um, for most of you probably know, in 2014, the city of Flint decided to drink their, change their drinking water source from Lake Huron to Flint River water, um, and that led to uh, old lead pipes uh, or lead seep seeping into the drinking water supply within the city. And I just remember that this was really a life-changing experience for everyone in Flint, and it was really a huge breach of trust uh, for the people in the community. The Flint water crisis was a government-made problem. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, the government made the decision to switch to that water supply, and then once they did that and people were complaining and saying that their water was discolored and that their water had a smell to it, they didn't believe the people, and it took months um, for testing to finally occur um, and for them to believe that there was an issue with our drinking water. And it was really hard to drive around the city of Flint and see people lined up uh, to get water bottles from the National Guard. Uh, you would see restaurants that were on the border of Flint and the suburbs with signs that said, we don't have Flint drinking water. Um, and that was just a really stark contrast to what life was like before that. And I just remember visiting my grandmother who still lived in the city at the time and seeing just piles and piles of water bottles lined up in her garage because that's the only way that you could have water in your house. You couldn't use water to brush your teeth, to take a bath, to cook with, or to drink. Um, and again, it took months uh, for people to get their homes tested to make sure that their drinking water was safe. Um, and so, like I said, I'm sad that the lead problem is a problem across the country, but I'm encouraged by these conversations. Uh, and I believe that access to safe and clean water is a human right. Um, and so I hope <coughs> that these conversations will continue and that we will continue to make changes in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tyrese. Next, to provide a, a bit of empirical context for today's event, uh, over the past 12 to 18 months, student researchers at our Water Law and Policy Initiative have surveyed some of the largest public water systems in Wisconsin about the lead pipe issue in their systems. So we asked them, for example, how many lead service lines they had, uh, how confident they were in their estimates, whether they had plans to replace those pipes, their level of concern over the problem, and much more. We also surveyed the laws in all 50 states to see where Wisconsin stands in comparison to the rest of the country in terms of the steps it is taking to solve the problem. So to tell you a little bit more about what we found, I want to invite two more students up to the stage, uh, Josh Kather and Ivy Becker. Uh, please come on up. Hello, my name is Josh Kather, and I'm a 3L here at Marquette. First off, I just wanted to say I really appreciated the opportunity to work on this project with Professor Stripling, Ivy, and for the contributions from prior students. My portion of the project involved the distribution of the survey and the recording of the results. We sent out a 12-question survey to 100 of the largest public water systems in Wisconsin and received responses from roughly one-third of them. Although our results do not account for a majority of the public water systems in Wisconsin, the survey does account for a large portion of the lead service lines in the state. In the survey itself, we asked both quantitative and qualitative questions related to the current status of service lines in each water system. The results to a few of these questions can be seen in this PowerPoint. This is the typical service line design. As you can see on the diagram above, the service line connects the water main, which can be seen on the far left, to the building or housing plumbing on the right. A typical property line can also be seen on the diagram, running vertically next to the sidewalk. The property owner is usually responsible for financing the replacement of the service line portion to the right of that dashed line. We asked each recipient the total number of service lines in their system. Responding systems contain an estimated total of roughly 480,000 service lines, including both lead and lead-free lines. About one-third of the lines are in Milwaukee, and two-thirds from the other 32 responding water systems. 
About a quarter, or roughly 118,000, of these service lines contain lead in some amount. Although Milwaukee contains only one third of the total service lines among responding systems, Milwaukee accounts for almost 60% or 70,000 of the estimated 118,000 lead service lines totaled from our respondents. According to the Wisconsin DNR, Wisconsin as a whole is estimated to contain 176,000 LSLs. So our respondents contain about two thirds of that estimated state total. As far as the accuracy of the estimates from our survey, almost all of the responding systems are somewhat or very confident in their numerical estimates. We also wanted to know the level of concern for each respondent. The level of concern generally, but not always, matched up with the number of LSLs in the public water system. Systems with less lead service lines were generally less concerned than those with more lead service lines. Milwaukee did respond that they were only slightly concerned. But they are also one of the public water systems with a plan in place to replace their LSLs. Bringing me to our next slide. 17 of the 19 systems containing LSLs say they have a plan to replace their lead service lines. The two that responded no, both have less than 7% of their service lines needing to be replaced. Fourteen of our respondents reported that their service lines are now lead free. Most notably is Green Bay, who now has 36,000 service lines that contain no lead. Followed by New Berlin, who has over 10,000 lead free service lines and Oak Creek with 9,500 lead-free service lines. Part of the LSL problem is a lack of transparency in the sharing of information. From our survey, 22 of the 33 respondents answered yes to providing information regarding lead service lines to their residents, while nine answered no. We also wanted to know if the public water systems had any other concerns about their water. Respondents were able to pick multiple answers for this choice, this question. 17 of the 34 respondents are concerned about the general water quality. Public safety was just below that. And nine responded that they were concerned with groundwater contamination. Something I want to note was that four responses included PFAS in their answer, this is a relatively new area of concern, and the research on PFAS and their health impacts is growing. Thank you. IV. All right, hello, good afternoon. My name is Ivy Becker and I'm a 3L here at Marquette. Um, my portion of the project consisted at, <clears throat> excuse me, at looking at all 50 states and seeing whether the states could one, provide an accurate estimate of the number of lead pipes it has and two, seeing how well that state is complying with two federal rules. Um, the first federal rule I looked at is the 2021 lead and copper rule revisions, which requires all water systems to have a detailed and comprehensive lead service line inventory completed by October of 2024. The second rule I looked at was the lead and copper rule improvements, which the EPA is expected to issue prior to that 2024 deadline. And this rule will have a focus on requiring water systems to have a replacement plan to help push towards the goal of 100% replacement of all lead service lines. So the National Resources Defense Council published a survey in 2021 in an attempt for states to provide accurate lead service line numbers. 
only 10 of those states were able to provide statewide numbers because they did some form of record keeping prior to that 2021 rule revision. The rest of the states could only provide partial estimates, but said that a lot of their pipes were of unknown material, which means that they could or could not be lead. The NRDC estimated that there is a total of 12.8 million known or potentially known lead pipes in this country. This survey demonstrate, demonstrates how truly difficult it is for states to have accurate reporting without some form of inventory mandate. I then grouped my research into three categories of activity, low, moderate, and high, based on these survey results and how well states were complying with the two previously mentioned federal rules. States with low levels of activity are essentially only focused on creating that inventory at the moment. So an example of this is Maryland. Maryland, according to the survey, has 74,000 lead pipes. But because the state has come out and said that they have not felt a need to create an inventory prior to that 2021 rule revision, this number may not be entirely accurate. And in February of 2022, the state found that 2% of its drinking water outlets had lead levels exceeding 20 parts per billion. And the Secretary of the Environment at that time said they were taking necessary remediation steps, but didn't say exactly what those steps were. This is considered low levels of activity because the state has yet to focus on any goal towards replacement based on any lead levels. States that fall within the category of moderate activity have some form of replacement plan already in use. And an example of this is Minnesota. Minnesota has about 260,000 lead pipes, which is the 10th highest state, and that number reflects data from portions, but not all of the state. So although it doesn't have a compre or I'm sorry, complete inventory yet, the state has already started lead service line replacement. The state plan requires all public water systems to replace a pipe if it exceeds the trigger level of 10 parts per billion or action level of 15 parts per billion. So although the plan is a reactive one and only replaces pipes if the lead levels are high enough, the state is already starting to think about and working towards that goal of 100% replacement. Lastly, a state is categorized as high activity if it requires mandatory replacement plan a mandatory replacement plan. And an example of this is Michigan. Michigan is the third highest state with an estimate of 460,000 lead pipes. It was only one of six states that reported numbers of unknown pipes, so again, that number may not be entirely accurate. However, in 2018, the state was very proactive and implemented its own mandatory rule that requires public water systems to have a replacement plan in effect. The plan requires those water systems to replace on average 5% of their lead service lines per year with a goal of reaching 100% replacement within 20 years. So this is considered high levels of activity because the state, even prior to creating an, an inventory, is taking steps to reach that goal of 100% replacement. As far as Wisconsin goes, Wisconsin can be categorized as moderate levels of activity. We have the seventh highest number of lead pipes in the country according to the NRDC survey with just under 330,000 and we were able to provide statewide pipe estimates. So even though our state has yet to require mandatory replacement, certain counties and cities are already creating their own plans and Milwaukee is an example. Milwaukee has an ordinance that requires full replacement of the lead service line if certain criteria are met, which is similar to Minnesota's statewide plan. So again, this is moderate activity because our state is beginning to think towards that goal of 100% replacement. So overall, my research demonstrated that the states that have already tracked their lead service lines are having an easier time complying with that inventory requirement. And because of that, that allows them to focus on the next step, which is mandatory replacement in order to reach that goal of 100% replacement of all lead pipes. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Josh and Ivy. Uh, and now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our distinguished guest, Congresswoman Gwen Moore. Uh, she was elected to represent Wisconsin's fourth congressional district in 2004, uh, becoming the first African-American elected to Congress from the state of Wisconsin. Her district represents much of Milwaukee County, and she's a member of the House Ways and Means Committee and the Joint Economic Committee. She's also an active member on the Democratic Women's Caucus, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, 
the LGBT Equity Caucus, uh, Equality Caucus, I apologize, the Congressional Black Caucus, the Great Lakes Caucus, and the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. She's a native of Racine and graduated from right here at Marquette University. Uh, and also, <laughs> yep. And also has earned a Harvard University certificate uh, for senior executives in state and local government. So please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Gwen Moore to the Lubar Center. Thank you so much. So I know how passionate you are about this issue of lead and water and lead service lines. Why is it so important to you? You know, it, it, I think it's part of my upbringing, actually. Uh, God willing, I will be 72 on the 18th of this month. Um, and I was around for Gaylord Nelson. I was around for the creation of Earth Day. Um, I have lived um, uh, long enough to see my, my dad and my aunts go fishing and pull stuff out of the water and, and we eat it. Um, and, and water has no, no enemies, according to an African proverb. Um, I, you know, felt good as a young kid. I had freedom, and I drinking out of our bubblers. For those of you who are not native Wisconsinites, you <laughs> don't know what a bubbler is. But uh, um, I, this is something that I took for granted. I, I never, I, at some point in my life, I swore that I would never pay for a bottle of water, something that I always took for granted. Um, and to see um, the, that even though water has no enemies, we all need water, but it has created such a war over those who want to pollute it and want to disregard care for it, those who don't have water and want uh, the water to flow over the water table, um, those people who uh, uh, want to use it for recreation, um, and people who want it to be a source of economic development. Now, that would be me as well. Uh, you know, concerned about invasive species, uh, about the inability to have like a port of call, uh, and uh, drinking water. Now, I have, I am a great grandmother, so I'm an uppercase G. <laughs> great grandmother Gwen. And my great-grandchildren call me G. My eldest great-granddaughter will be six. And I started buying water when my granddaughter showed me the brown stuff coming out of the faucet in her apartment. And I haven't stopped buying water since then. Um, and I realized that that's a luxury that everybody can't afford. Uh, and that is why I just sort of lose sleep over lead pipes um, because it is sort of the guilt of being able to buy water when I know the impact that lead pipes have on children. Um, just, just to be able just to sort of look at all of the cognitive delays and cognitive disabilities uh, within our community. Uh, and to realize that 2,500 kids a year, uh, the health department is reporting, have unsafe levels of lead in their blood and come to find out that the levels that they thought were, um, that were okay in the past, of course, there's no uh, level of lead that is appropriate. I also have empathy for landlords and low-income um, landlords, I live in a house that was built in 1920. What is the chance that there aren't, there's not lead paint there? But because there's sort of an inverse relationship between the age of property and your ability to get loans to repair it, um, uh, to support the value, even, even if you can get a loan, um, on your own recognizance and credit worthiness, um, they, they still will evaluate the property for what it's worth. And what would a landlord do if we asked him to replace 
the pipes leading from the street to that to the house. Already in the state of Wisconsin, 48% of our residents are rent burdened. That means that they pay more than a third of their income for housing. Uh, and we see um, it, housing being one of the greatest sort of stressors uh, affecting our mental health, homeless population. It's so embarrassing that some man, Desmond, Matthew Desmond, wrote a book about Milwaukee, you know, evicted, and we're, we're paying monies for properties that are probably uh, not fit. I learned from um, Jason um, here today, he confirmed that 60% of these lead service pipes are like in Milwaukee. Uh, and of course, when you look around at the age of homes in Milwaukee, um, uh, you, you know, well, 60% uh, of them have been built uh, uh, before uh, 1960 for sure. And so uh, my passion comes from really wanting to have smart great grandchildren. Uh, <laughs> I, and I just think that there are some very, very strategic engineering and biological and physical and chemical things that I can do, like giving them good food and good water. I mean, we could just start there. I mean, it's so rudimentary and fundamental. Uh, preventable, uh, I have seen the results uh, we have champions in our community, mothers who have dealt with lead poisoning of their children, and their children, uh, children have cognitive disabilities that are not reversible. Um, there are studies that have been done to demonstrate that uh, they, people who are incarcerated, imprisoned, who have um, uh, uh, you know, impulse control. Um, a lot of it could be from exposure to lead, uh, the violent. Uh, and so um, we just cannot ignore the science here um, when we consider our future workforce. We consider uh, that people could just lose out on their ability to have a successful life even before they're born. Um, and so I'm passionate about it because of my background, my culture, my upbringing. I love Lake Michigan. It's the, it's the only great lake that is entirely within the continental USA. It's nobody else's responsibility to clean it up and take care of it. It's ours. And you know, when I won my election, um, on election night, I thanked everybody and I just said, my favorite thing to represent is Lake Michigan. <laughs> and, um, and I have, it's, it's been a big part of my stewardship. So that's why I'm passionate. Yeah, very good. I, uh, I wanted to ask what you think of the job Milwaukee has done in addressing this problem. You know, we saw in the presentation that it has 70,000 lead laterals. It's the biggest um, hotspot in the state for lead. What do you think of the job that the city is doing in the water utility? Well, you know, I became very empathetic with former Mayor Tom Barrett. Um, and he was being beaten up, I felt, um, unjustly for the situation with lead pipes. He was dancing as fast as he could. If we had taken every single, not that the state would have given us our fair share, that's a different lecture. <laughs> <laughs> well, we might get but, to that. But, 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 but not that they would have given our fair share, but the reality is that they had given us every single dollar that the state was allotted in the Safe Drinking Water Fund, the Wastewater uh, uh, Fund, it would not have been enough to get rid of those lead pipes. And Tom was doing the best he could, and it would have taken him 70 years to do it. The, um, the, um, the monies that we have gotten from the bipartisan infrastructure bill 
And I'm reluctant to call it that. <laughs> Considering it only takes one or two Republicans to vote for it, for it to be bipartisan. But that's another conversation as well. Um, we, we, this has really put us um, ahead of the game um, um, to be able to address it. Um, and so now I think the goal for 2023 is to remove 1,200 of these lead laterals, which is a much greater pace than we would have uh, experienced. It would have taken 70 years. And I'm going to be 72 on the 18th, and I don't know. I was thinking, thinking of sticking around for 70 years, but maybe I, I might want a little rest before then. <laughs> it's good to see it being done um, and addressed. Um, and I want to see a product, and it's not just Milwaukee. Uh, I represent West Milwaukee. Uh, they've got a problem, Shorewood, uh, uh, older community. Um, and, um, you, know, you know, West Milwaukee, they were thinking of just, you know, fixing up crumbling streets and just forgetting about the lead laterals because they thought they weren't eligible. So we've been reaching out. Our office has been reaching out, offering assistance with, to get, you know, member-directed spending or supporting grants uh, to speed the process up. Um, and so I am, I am really, really proud um, of what they're doing. We've get, we're getting a little help from the feds, too. Um, Wisconsin has been put on a, um, a lead replacement accelerator program so that Wisconsin is one of the places that they are going to... Um, we're, they're going to accelerate the removal of these lead pipes. And so uh, I am really really pleased with that. I was really pleased when I got uh, that announcement. You said we're getting a little help from the feds. That's you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Me, and, and also that accelerator program. But people know um, how I feel uh, about, about water. Uh, I've consistently worked on it. Um, uh, you know, just, just hustling dollars. I'm also a part of what's called the Great uh, Lakes, a uh, member of the Great Lakes Caucus, headed up by uh, Marcy Kaptur from Ohio, the Dean of Congress, you know, to try to make sure that we get um, in, some infrastructure and funding uh, for the Great Lakes. Um, you know, and also I've done just little things like getting some of these estuaries uh, being regarded as, you know, lakes for the purposes of being able to fund uh, research and, and, and stuff. So I, I really think, I really think that, you know, if water has no enemies, we can't talk about this without talking about equity. I mean, who, who lives in these areas where, all the, where the lead pipes are not, have not been replaced? Who lives in an area where there, there is not new housing? I thought I heard, um, was it, was it uh, Ivy or, was it Ivy or Jason that said that like places like New Berlin? Josh. Josh. Okay, I knew I'd get it. All I had to do was say one more name. It was Josh. <laughs> Josh was saying, you know, New Berlin practically has all, all new, because it's a newer community versus my community where I live, where 60% of them. So, so when we start talking about equity, um, I think that that's where we can anticipate a fight. Because, you know, while it's really important to make sure that everybody has access to clean water, um, we, need to, we need to go where the emergency is. We can, it, it's not fair to have 2,500 kids a year in the city of Milwaukee poisoned with lead. I mean, that's, you know, and, and we know better. Uh, we cannot do things that appear to be genocidal. So, 
Uh, we've got to, there, there's a professor in Madison, UW-Madison, uh, who is uh, working on a grant um, to a, a, a technology, something that the engineering students and law students might be interested in. Uh, and that research really um, looks at, um, actually, how does it work? Technology to, to just determine where the worst places are and how to prioritize uh, which lead pipes we ought to do first. Um, oh, here it is, an equity index. Waterworks has set a goal of replacing these 1,200 pipes, and, it, and it's going to uh, do 500 on top of that, and it's going to use uh, an equi equity index um, so that they can sort of rank the priorities um, uh, in the city of Milwaukee. Um, and so uh, I, I think when we talk about equity, I also want to talk about just job creation from this. I mean, why not uh, turn a catastrophe into an opportunity to, to, to make money? Um, now, the problem is, is that we are going to have to, as politicians, as engineers, as law students, we're going to have to make the public aware as the students present it. We're going to have to, to increase people's concern about it because, you know, we need, you know, almost a trillion dollars over the next 20 years to be able to deal with this on a nationwide basis. And that is up 32% from when we first evaluated and assessed this in 2018 because inflation costs increased for doing it. Basic fact, if you defer building it or maintaining it, then it's just gonna cost you more to do it. So we're at a point in water safety um, where we really do need the public to understand the health threats to not only drinking water, but some of the things that, you know, cleaning wastewater and having, uh, doing research and studies with regard to, here, here's what I learned today. The kinds of materials and uh, stuff that can, can clean the bacterium that come in pipes and, um, it, uh, you know, Tyrese has told us about his hometown of Flint. I, I sit next to Dan Kildy. I get so sick of hearing about Flint. He talks about Flint every single day. Uh, and, and here I come to my own hometown. I got to hear about Flint. <laughs> so, so I'm going to tell him all about you. But on, on the serious side, you know, you said this, this was a government-made problem not to use the knowledge and technology, cutting corners, saving costs, whatever, uh, and really costing people uh, their lives and, and their health. And so to the extent we're gonna have to fund this, we, we're, we're, we're going to need people to be mad about this, you know, anxious about it, uh, as they have been. You know, so I talked about how Tom caught a lot of heck. Actually, he caught hell about the pipes. But, you know, it, this is the way democracy works. And this is, a, this, is, this is something that we need to do. Now, what we ought to be grateful for is that we have Market University right here. And I just had an opportunity before I came in here to really look at how we are coordinating all of our resources in engineering and biology and, 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 and even political science and education um, to be able to create the environment um, for resourcing it. This is all about choices. It is really all about choices. You know, we decide to 
provide monies to Ukraine, which I support. Um, you, you know, nobody asked where the money was going to come from. We just did what the right thing is to do. And again, water has no enemies. This is something we all need. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, male, female, Muslim, Catholic, young, old, we all need it. Uh, and so clearly, this is an opportunity for us to come together. Do you think the federal government is doing enough, the Biden administration, the EPA, or do you wish there was more money, more guidance, more time? I wish there were more money. Uh, and again, you know, a lot of work that was done in the 118th Congress, and I will, I mean, 117th Congress, I'll always be proud to say that that was a North Star sort of session. I mean, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of young people here, uh, but I mean, you know, I mean, it, the investment that Eisenhower did on the freeways or, you know, what Johnson did with Medicaid, Medicare, I mean, it's just equivalent. It's like, to paraphrase Joe Biden, I mean, it's a big deal. <laughs> um, and, you know, but I was on the budget committee for 10 years, and I do know that we had uh, a divided houses. And so a lot of stuff that we did through the bipartisan infrastructure, um, uh, through, the, um, through the Reconciliation Act, you know, we did bi bipartisan, but we did other sorts of things that have a nexus with uh, clean water. And we could only do it through uh, an infrastructure, uh, through uh, uh, the, the budget reconciliation bill. And there's this person that you'll never hear of or see called the parliamentarian over in the Senate um, that is very strict about things that aren't directly related to the budget being part of it. And so we had to negotiate around real tight strictures in order to be able to produce the bills that we did. It was a miracle, the amount of funding that we got through. Uh, and then we had to negotiate with, uh, with the Senate. The bipartisan infrastructure bill was a bill uh, that is very conservative as compared to where we need to be. Uh, and so everybody recognizes that it's a camel's nose under the tent. I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'll open it up for uh, the audience uh, to ask some questions. Um, what are your constituents telling you about this? Is it an important issue for them, and do they talk to you about it? You know, it, unfortunately, it's a problem when it becomes a problem for them. One of my constituents moved out of a house because her kid was sick. He ended up in the ICU. Uh, they were supposed to have remediated it. They moved back into the house, and, and it still had lead in it, and he was reinfected. Her other kids were inflicted with it. You know, I think that my constituents are forced into low wage, uh, low rental units. And I don't, I'm not sure they can allow themselves the luxury of worrying about it. I mean, they, they, they are cognizant about not letting their kids eat, let, you know, crumbles. Um, but I, I, I don't know that they're in the position to buy water and to, and to call their landlord up and cuss him out and say, I want the pipes changed. I just think they're, they're in a bind. I think that, you know, not dealing with it is, is, is a coping mechanism that a lot of people employ because they have no other alternatives. Yeah, for a lot of different things, not just water, right? Not just water. Um, our Lubar Center program manager, Hillary Bois, is going to be walking around with a microphone. So if you have a question for the congresswoman, uh, please raise your hand, and she'll make her way to you. Yes. Uh, you know, and by the way, while you're doing it, I'm going to tell you, I went to Liberia. That was the first African country I went to um, ever. 
And we had a, like a town hall meeting and we had bottles of water in front of us. And of course the military who was escorting us always, you know, didn't want us to eat in strange places. And this was a war torn country and they didn't have sand, you know, you know, clean drinking water and facilities. This was after the war. And so we sat there like the bougie Americans we were <laughs> and left water bottles on the table. And afterwards, the women from everywhere ran up to get these water bottles, pouring from in our glasses back into the, to the bottles. When I got there, there was a, a little girl that came and begged me for my water bottle. And I said, oh no, sweetie, I've been drinking out of it. And the man, our guy said, that is the cleanest water she's going to have probably in her entire life. And when you give her the water, she's not gonna be able to keep it. The boys are gonna take, take it from her. And indeed they did. I gave her that water bottle and you can see down the road that she, that bottle was wrestled away from her. Mm. And so, um, yeah. People aren't necessarily aware, you know, Tyrese, until until they start, the water starts stinking and it's brown. Yeah. Yes. All right. Hi, Gwen. Um, as a freshwater scientist at the other school, UW Milwaukee. <clears throat> That's okay. I love I love UW Milwaukee too. I, know I went you to Upper Bound there. Um, one thing that we worked with were some of the engineers who worked on the project at Newark, which, if you don't know, is a model for um, how to replace lead service lines in the country. They did it in three years. Um, and part of that reason is because they, unlike us, um, failed at using like their orthophosphate in the same way that we do to corrosion control our pipes here. Um, they were sued by the NRDC, National Resources Defense Council, because um, their lead pipes were um, leaching into the water system and people couldn't drink water. And so what happened is their state has since mandated, and New Jersey has, when I looked at your chart, um, it has the same amount of, you know, almost the same amount of lead pipes as Wisconsin. And they've now mandated that they will replace all lead service lines, but what they did is they were able to get the amount of money needed to replace all the private service lines too. Oh. And so if we talk about environmental justice in Milwaukee where people can't afford as landlords to replace those lead laterals, you know, that's something we have to address here because you can only, you know, I live in Tosa, I know where my lead le pipes are, I filter my water, but it's because I know that my house was built in 1930 and even if I had copper all the way up to my house, I'm sure there's fittings somewhere in my house that have lead and I'm gonna protect my family. Um, and so, you know, we're not gonna be sued in Milwaukee because we still provide very quality drinking water. In fact, you know, your Aquafina was probably bottled Milwaukee water. We're one oh of the God, three bottling please. companies. <laughs> um, however, you know. I ask you to get to the question. My question is, is how do we, besides getting sued and failing at our job, how do we get that, that funding to be able to replace the public and private at the same time, because that's what's really going to make the difference here in Milwaukee. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, there's there's a lot of conversation about public-private partnerships. You know, we give a lot of tax credits and tax deductions out to people, and I think there ought to be a match. You know, for some of it. Um, uh, you know, I think. The private sector, you know, I can remember when I first got in the office, I was over at the, at a, looking, looking at a ditch in a neighborhood and they had chromium, green slime at the bottom of a pit where a, a, a paint shop had been. And it, there was a big wheel right there in the slime. And you know, I made the I made the the DNR here in Wisconsin go door to door and warn people. They did they didn't even have a fence around it. And I was a state rep, made them put a fence around it until it could be cleaned up and go door to door uh, and remind people and ask people to get checked. Um, 
the health risks, and of course, their children who were sliding down into this, to these uh, chromates uh, every day. So I think that environmental justice does mean that, that there are private entities um, that, uh, that need to, to, to help us, because it's not just lead pipes, it's paint too. And, you know, a lot of times people knew that there were problems with their product and they did it anyway. Um, I think that we can also um, uh, develop some sort of tax credit structure to reward companies who are looking for tax breaks. Instead of getting a tax break just because you're rich, you know, maybe get a tax break because you're sort of helping out with a public health crisis. Thank you. I think there was a hand in the back. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Moore, um, Richard Diaz with Blue Green Alliance, and also with the Coalition on Lead Emergency. How you doing? <laughs> Good to see you again. Um, so oftentimes, you know, the public perception of lead service lines really doesn't have much to do with lead poisoning. And lead poisoning really being the serious concern that we are all trying to avoid with lead service line replacement. Um, at the federal level, HUD is handling uh, lead paint abatement, the EPA is handling lead service line replacement at the local level, City of Milwaukee Water Works is handling lead service line replacement, the health department is handling the response to a lead poisoning case. Um, how can we encourage better collaboration between HUD and the EPA at the federal level and also at the local level between the health department and water work so that when a child is lead poisoned, we can trigger a lead service line replacement on their property if there is one present? Well, I mean, it sounds like a great idea to, to raise. Isn't there some sort of um, a committee that the governor has convened or the county has convened just in terms of how, making suggestions of how to spend the, ARPA money, um, and to not just blow it all away, but to have some community input. I mean, because that sounds like a great idea. I mean, one of the frustrations of being at a level, at, at, at the federal level, is because you, you fight hard for this money. I particularly fought to make sure we got HUD money to deal with the lead paint because quite frankly, that's a worse problem in Milwaukee than pipes, paint. Um, so I thought to, 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 to get money for that. But luckily, I have a relationship with Tony Evers and with David Crowley and with Cavalier Johnson so that I can, that they're very clear about my desire to have it trickle down, as it were, to my community. You talk to people like Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, and you know she just says, once that money hits Texas, it goes wherever their governor wants it to go. You th I think of my colleague, Benny Thompson. You know, he lives, you know, a hop, skip, and a jump from the capital of Mississippi, Jackson, and it's the raggediest place in the world because of the demographics of the city. And of course, the water problems that they're dealing with. So, you know, I appreciate y'all's work because uh, equity has to be intentional. You know, people will be quick to say, "Oh, we don't have we don't have any workers trained to do this." Oh, we don't. It has to be intentional, and that's why I was really happy to look at this model that people are recognizing that Milwaukee ought to be targeted. Um, that's intentional. Uh, that's not saying, oh, we'll get to you when we can. And so I, I think that, and it has to be monitored. That's, that's, that's your job. And to tell on them when they're not doing it. We've got time for at least one more question, if anyone has one. I saw, saw some young lady over here, too. Andy, I. Uh I own a house in Glendale for almost 40 years now. Um, house was built in 1940, and I'm at the southern end of Glendale, which is practically Milwaukee, right across the street from Silver Spring. 
Obviously, if the funding goes, if the Glendale ever gets mentioned in terms of lead pipes, and I know that mine is because it comes out horizontally out of the wall and makes a full arc turn vertically, and only lead can make that kind of a turn, uh, back in 1940 anyway, how do we handle replacements in a house like mine? Uh, I live off of Social Security essentially now, and all of the 40 years that I've owned the house, I frankly couldn't afford a thousand, fifteen hundred dollar bill worth of anything. Uh, how do we make sure that even if Glendale ever gets some sort of a funding, that they spend it on on places like ours, if it is to replace the lead pipes? Because lots of Glendale, for example, is just like New Berlin, very new and very modern. Well, that's an important question because I just was working with West Milwaukee, for example. Uh, and they thought they couldn't do it because of the way they read the regulations. But what I have learned is that for s certain of the grants, you can have an MOU with the city of Milwaukee. The city of Glendale could have a memorandum of understanding where 80% of the monies would be provi provided and then Glendale would have to ante up the other 20%. And again, we've been talking all morning here about extending that to not just lead service lines, you know, but what do you call them when they're going to the house? Fix fixtures, valves inside the house. Yeah, yeah. From, from, from the street to the house. Oh, the service lines. Service lines. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't do you much good to have a replaced line and it's still coming into your house. Um, with, with, with the stuff, and so yeah, we need to, to make sure that we do grants. Right now, they've got a program where they've decided to do whole streets, not just, uh, so I heard your questions about, you know, you know, emergencies, but I mean, there are whole streets that they're doing, and so what's the point in doing the whole street without offering residents on that block various remedies based on their capacity. If they're homeowners, you know, uh, you know that, that's a program. Uh, if they are renting, then working with their landlords to do it and having a grant uh, program uh, separate from, from that. I mean, I'm, I'm all for that. I hope I would qualify myself, Gwen Moore, so I could stop buying water. Well, I think we're just about out of time, so let's stop it there to uh, make sure that we end on time. And thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking uh, Congresswoman Gwen Moore.